Richard Pimentel's work was the first design that we found that targeted employers and dealt with attitudinal change. Last year, we had the opportunity to see Richard present at a conference in Yukon that we were both speaking at, and after seeing his presentation, it only reinforced that we want to bring Richard to Calgary and share his message with all of you. Yesterday, we held an employer forum that brought in about 90 employers from various industries in the business community in Calgary. Dr. Richard Pimentel had the opportunity to send a message to employers that attitudinal change is the biggest barrier to finding employment for persons with disabilities to finding employment. And it's clear, as all of our networks, employer networks are expanding, that the business community is interested and looking for solutions to attract and retain employees with disabilities. Dr. Richard Pimentel is a nationally renowned expert on disability management, job recruitment, job retention, and attitude change. As a consultant, a keynote speaker, professional trainer, and author of numerous curricula and training guides, Dr. Pimentel is distinguished by his ability to predict industry trends and the needs of employers. Rich's training has helped managers and supervisors to dispel stereotypes and embrace a more inclusive workplace, both culturally and the physical work environment. Dr. Pimentel began his work conducting diversity-based disability attitude training about 35 years ago in Portland, Oregon. In 1981, Dr. Pimentel developed Tilting at Windmills, an interactive disability attitude training program designed for managers and supervisors to become more objective and effectively interview and work with people with disabilities. In 1988, Dr. Pimentel co-authored Perspectives, AIDS in the Workplace, an attitudinal training program that was the first of its kind and was adopted by many federal government agencies, including the US Army and Fortune 500 companies. In 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law and Richard Pimentel is acknowledged by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission Chair as a significant contributor to educating employers on disability employment issues. And in 2007, a full-length motion picture of Richard's life story was released called Music Within, which I highly recommend seeing if you haven't, and it's available on Netflix. We thought Dr. Pimentel's message to employers was important, and we want to reinforce this message to the community that works directly with people with disabilities. We felt it was important for you to connect with him as a resource, and we want to continue to capitalize on the momentum that we're building here in Calgary. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Richard Pimentel. Thank you, thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is not my first rodeo to, uh, to Canada. After the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, I was asked to come to Canada to work with your, your federal uh, uh, folks in the Canadian federal law uh, for Canadians with, with disabilities and was hired by the uh, Canadian Bankers Association, a wonderful uh, woman by the name of Suzanne Bergeron, who was the diversity manager. And she took me uh, across Canada, teaching all the banks how to hire and how to work with folks with, uh, with disabilities. And I remember when I got, uh, got the call and asked if, uh, if I'd like to come to Calgary, my, my only question was, is it as cold as Winnipeg? <laughs> and they said, no, no, this is where, this is where people from Winnipeg come to warm up. I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come. So I've been, I've been thrilled to be here, and I, uh, I had a grand time yesterday with, uh, with, with employers. If, if, you know, if you listen to that Vita, it, you know, it, it just makes everything sound like, you know, everything is sort of plotted out, and, you go and you make all these big changes in life and, and you know, all this stuff. Well, let me tell you who I really am. Uh, for all the other stuff that you hear, I'm an old job developer. Uh, I started out uh, not caring about the field of disability in any way at all. 
I was a young man, I was 18, I was uh, uh, pretty good shape, a little athletic. Uh, it was 1966, and I wanted to go to college, wanted to become a business person, and I couldn't afford to go to college. I was raised very poor. And the government at that time, the US government, was running this wonderful program where you could trade government service for college education. Uh, you might, some of you might have heard of that program. It was called Vietnam. And uh, I, when I got my acceptance letter to that, I went down to the induction center and was uh, okayed and sent to Fort Lewis, Washington, where they trained me to become a soldier, and then they sent me to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, where I went through airborne parachute training, I went through Recondo training, and I was sent uh, to Vietnam uh, for the 101st Airborne Division uh, as a long-range recon patrol uh, person on a five-man recon team. And we went over for the Tet Offensive. Any of you uh, remember at all the Tet Offensive or know about it? Uh, actually, I didn't go to Vietnam for the Tet Offensive. Had I known about the Tet Offensive, I believe I would have gone to Toronto for the Tet Offensive. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, uh, we survived that and survived a few more things. And uh, I became disabled in Vietnam. Towards the end of the tour, we were in a bunker. A rocket hit the bunker. Uh, and uh, uh, normally, when a rocket hits a bunker in Vietnam, you're dead. But the bunker that we were in was actually the beer bunker. We had snuck into the beer bunker, and we were drinking beer. And the beer bunker was the, the best built bunker in all of Vietnam, <laughs> uh, which I know you Canadians can appreciate. And, uh, uh, it held, yet there was an explosion on the outside of the bunker and an implosion on the inside of the bunker, uh, which is air traveling at high velocities in a confined space, and you don't want to be there. Well, the person in the worst part of the bunker literally had his eyes blown out of his head. Everyone else was made totally, completely deaf. Anyone work with hearing impaired deaf folks here? Team man? Okay. I lost... Uh, uh, all of my upper register uh, hearing, a lot of my lower register hearing, I have about 120, 125 dB loss in each ear uh, in the higher register, and I came out basically considered deaf. Uh, I also had a traumatic brain injury uh, from the explosion. Anyone work with uh, traumatic brain injuries here? Okay. and. Uh, Traumatic brain injuries today are a lot different than traumatic brain injuries in 1968. Uh, 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 the, the reason is uh, medicine is so much better. Uh, diagnosis is so much better. Uh, very few people uh, in Vietnam survived traumatic brain injuries back in the, uh, the days where uh, the soldiers in uh, Afghanistan, I know, I know you, uh, Certainly had some of those, and uh, uh, and in Iraq doing uh, uh, consulting work in there. Uh, they could be treated right on the battlefield. I was lucky; I made it to the hospital ship, so I came home uh, deaf and with a traumatic brain injury. I had to uh, learn uh, to lip read. Uh, I wanted to be pretty oral and get back, and because I was in a speech society. I didn't want to do the sign language, uh, I just wanted to be oral, so I, I took about three years of lip reading, and then I went through the treatment for the traumatic brain injury where I had to learn to, to do everything again. I had to learn to speak again, uh, I had to learn to walk again, I had to learn to drive, it took me two years uh, before I could drive, I couldn't get my brain and my feet and my arms working all at the same time. Funny though how your how memory works. Well, I didn't know how to drive. I did first remember how to ride a bike, so I, I rode a bike going to going to college. 
and I uh, I work through that, and suddenly I get to enter the ranks of of, of people with disability. And I know that, that everyone who works in this field certainly isn't isn't disabled, but but if you talk to most people in this field, you know at some point there's a turning point. Uh, I doubt any of you with children when you're asked, and what do you want to do for a living? Uh, said, I want to work with persons with disabilities. Uh, probably not. Uh, so there's a reason that we're all here. Uh, each of it is interesting, each of it is personal. Um, I want to go to college. And now I'm a disabled Vietnam vet. And I figured, well, you know, it's not so bad because now that I'm disabled, I'll be able to go to college. And I went to see a, a, a Veterans Administration rehab counselor. Do we have any uh, actual rehab counselors here? Professional rehab counselors? Any hands? Uh, okay, so we can talk about them. Uh, <laughs> so I got to the rehab counselor and said, I, wa I want to go to college. And, and he says, I don't think I can approve a university level program for you, Mr. Pimentel. I said, why not? He said, cause your dad I said, what? <laughs> these these rehab they have no sense of humor. <laughs> I, I said, well, you know, if I'm deaf, why are you talking to me? He said, well, you're not quite deaf. He said, you're worse than deaf. He said, if you're deaf, I just send you to gobble deaf and make good deaf person out of you. He says, but, but you got no upper register hearing. You got good lower register hearing. Uh, and so, you know what's in the upper register? I go, oh, what? That'd be the ends and beginnings of your consonants. So all your T's, your D's, your G's, your B's, all going to sound the same. He said, you know what's in the lower register? That's what you hear. So what's in there? That'd be your vowels, your A, your E, your I, your O, your O. But not your Y's. Not even sometimes. I said, okay. And he said, so I, I can't do it. Said, what do you want to be? I said, well, I want to be a professional speaker, and I want to be a consultant. And he says, no, 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 because you're deaf, and you got, what you got is you got traumatic brain injury, and I got this book here that says you can't do it. 1968, 1969, rehab, the people who work with people with disabilities, had a book, and the book listed disabilities. And then it listed jobs that these people with disabilities could do. And the rehab people were only permitted to put people in the jobs that had been duly thought out and authorized by the experts. And so if you wanted to do something and you had a disability, you wanted to do something that wasn't on the list, they told you no. And so he took, I remember he took the book, took the, and he went to the, to the, the, the death page. And they did, they had deaf, deaf. I had a list of all these jobs. And he turns the book to me. And he says, do you see professional speaker on this list? I said, no. Well. And then he turned to the traumatic brain injury page. And he put it in front of me, showed me the list. He said, do you see consultant on this list? I said, no. Well. I said, well, could I see the book a minute? He said, yeah. And I turned to what we called then mental retardation. And I turned to the retardation page. And I turned the book around and I showed him the list. And he looked at it. I said, do you see rehab counselor on that list? <laughs> He said, no. I said, well. <laughs> they wrote me down in the file as uncooperative with unrealistic career uh, 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 desires. <laughs> anyway, they refused my rehab program. They said I was not viable for rehab. But that's OK, because I went to college on my own. And I went there and did this stuff, and while I was in college, uh, I met a man. 
Then God comes. Our Hyman had cerebral palsy. Who works with folks with cerebral palsy? Anyone want to see me? All right. How much cerebral palsy does my friend Art have? Oh my gosh, his speech was unintelligible. His tongue fell out of his mouth like the lead singer in Kiss. His arms flailed about his head. He couldn't have an electric wheelchair. He'd have killed every domestic animal in the neighborhood. He could have had, he had a, a, a regular wheelchair and he couldn't move it forward because he didn't have enough arm control. So he moved it backwards, one step at a time. How much cerebral palsy did Arthur Honeyman have? Arthur Honeyman had more CP than Lindsay Lohan has bad judgment. <laughs> and no one could understand it. And he was a fixture around the school. I mean, you couldn't help but notice him. And uh, I remember one day a, a, a co-ed, a young freshman girl came to him and said, because uh, when he moved his wheelchair, he pushed it with a foot, but he couldn't push it forward. So he pushed it backwards. So we'd see Art Mahali be coming at you in his wheelchair backwards. And she came and she said, when you come at me backwards in the hall, it's really spooky. And I wonder if it kind of freaks me out. I wonder if you could do something about that. And Art was so nice. He went to the store, got a Halloween mask, and put on the back of his head. <laughs> so for two years, when you saw Art in school, it looked like Spider-Man coming at you in a go-kart. I would have never talked to Art, because no one could understand him. And I was busy reading lips, or learning to read lips. But one day in the cafeteria, I saw him, and he was, he was laboring. He was distressed. He was trying to open a can of Coca-Cola, and he couldn't get it open. It was falling down on the table. He was trying to get a straw in it, and that wasn't working. And I looked over, 1969. And I said, here's a man with a Coke problem. <laughs> Back in 1969, that was a Coke problem. Couldn't get your Coke. And I went up to him, and I said, Art, you don't know me. Let me help you with your soda. And I opened it up. I took the straw out of his pocket, put the straw in the Coke. I said, don't talk to me, I'm deaf. I can't understand you. No one can understand you. I surely cannot understand you. I'm deaf. I'm learning to read lips. But I can't read your lips. I'll just get seasick, I'll probably throw up. <laughs> and I turn to leave, and Art grabs me. How does he grab me? He has involuntary movement. And he wants, to, he wants me to sit down. He wants me to talk to him. I don't want to talk to him. But I did what every deaf person does in a situation like that. I sat down and I decided, even though I won't understand him, I'll pretend to understand him. I'll simply shake my head, smile, I'll agree with everything he says, and then I'll leave. Do you know the deaf people do this? We do it a lot. Some of you do it. Some of you have been promoted for no more than this. <laughs> And he started to talk to me, and the heavens opened up. There was a strange anomaly, my friends. Art's speech, so significantly affected by his cerebral palsy, and my hearing, so severely distorted by the explosion that I was in, were direct mirrors of each other. I could understand every word he said. Later we verified that when we made the movie. We went and had his speech recorded and had my hearing uh, test and they put his speech and my hearing next to each other on this giant graph, moved them together and they were nearly identical. It was so odd. And I could understand him. And we became friends. We became friends not just because I could understand him. We became friends because he was an interesting person. He was a genius. His IQ was over my cholesterol level. <laughs> and people would come up to him. They always wanted to talk to him, even though they couldn't understand him, because he was so smart. And they'd say, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? 
An art would go for about a half hour. And then they'd turn to me and say, Richard, what did he say? And I'd tell them. And then they talked to me for a while. But I don't understand them. I'm deaf. So I turned to Art and say, Art, what did he say? <laughs> and Art would tell me, we were the darndest couple you've ever seen in your lives. And I gotta tell you, they wouldn't let us into a movie. <laughs> I started looking around at that moment. Now we're in the very early 70s, 1970s. And saw the way people with disabilities were treated. There weren't curb cuts, barely any parking spaces, no public transportation. Uh, the best disability cartoon of the day was a picture of a fellow in a wheelchair at the bottom of a long, long bunch of stairs headed into a building, and in the building's window it said, Help Wanted the person in the wheelchair sitting looking at it, knowing you could never get up the stairs, never get in the door, to even tell him that he wanted to work. Art had that picture on his mirror. I saw the disabled vets, and I, I knew that even though they were going to college and would probably graduate, because people with disabilities who were sent to secondary and post-secondary school tend to graduate. Anyone know that? How many know that when you send someone with a disability uh, to secondary, post-secondary training, that they have a higher likelihood of finishing that training than any other minority group does? Does anyone know that? Higher likelihood. They're more likely to finish than any other minority group in this country. Unfortunately, how many know that when they finish, they're the least likely group to ever find employment? Yet today we still dance with the old music that says the reason people with disabilities don't have jobs is because they're unqualified. That's not true. People with disabilities are the best educated and trained group of unemployed people in the history of the world. It's not about qualification. It's about perception. Art had a birthday. And he wanted pancakes. You love pancakes. And he called me at three in the morning. I said, how did he call you? He knocked the phone over. He lived in the dorm. Back then we actually had telephone operators, switchboard people. And he'd go to the phone, he'd go, oh, 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 oh. And whenever they heard that, they used to set the call to my room. <laughs> So I got all the calls from Art. I got a lot of calls from drunk people. <laughs> I got a few calls from people on drugs because it was the 70s. And I got two excellent dates, one of which I still remember. <laughs> but we won't go into that. Bottom line, he said it's my birthday. I got 10 bucks. Pancake. I knew what he wanted. He wanted me to come get him dressed, but he couldn't dress himself. He wanted me to carry his wheelchair out of the dorm because it wasn't accessible. He wanted me to push his wheelchair to the pancake house. It was six blocks. He wanted me to carry his wheelchair up the stairs to the pancake house because there was no ramp. He wanted me to get him in the door, put him at a table, order for him, cut his pancakes, and feed him. And for this, he was going to buy me breakfast. <laughs> Sounded like a good deal. And we had done it before. But when we got there, how many have been in this field for more than a few years? How many can remember when people with disabilities simply weren't welcome in public places and would be criticized openly if they were? And the parents of children with disabilities would be chastised and criticized for bringing them into a public place. Anyone remember that? Good. We have some old people like me. The waitress came to work. That woman changed my life. 
and I don't even know her name. She came to Art, and she looked at him, and what I'm about to say, because I know you work with people with disabilities, and what I'm about to say is really harsh, but it really happened. Some of you younger ones, some of you younger folks, may not even believe this story to be true. But if you don't believe it to be true, look at some of the older ones here, and they will tell you this happened back in the day. The waitress came to Art and said, you are the ugliest, most grotesque, disgusting looking thing I have ever seen in my life. I don't even know if you're a human being. I can't believe you have come here where people are trying to eat. You're going to make us sick. I can't believe you want me to bring you food. I don't know how you're going to eat it. Like some pig in a trough. I won't serve you. Get out. And then she pointed to the sign. You reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. Get out. I thought people like you were supposed to die for it. This is my best friend in the world. I looked at him. I'd never heard anyone talk to him this way. Is this going to be the end of him? Is this going to be the you know, life of, of criticism and stares? Is this going to be the last straw? Will, he, will, will this magnificent man finally break? He was a genius. But did I tell you he was an evil genius? And he was. And he looked at me, and I thought he was going to cry. And then he smiled. And here is what he said. He looked at me and said, Richard, why do you think she's talking to you that way? <laughs> you don't look any worse than you normally look. Lord knows I've wanted to say this to you before. But you're my friend. I said, she's not talking to me. She's talking to you. He said, how can you be sure? I think she wants to date me. I think she's just trying to get rid of you. And we get an argument over which one she wants to date. And this really made her angry. And she said, I'm calling the police. And I said, call them. And she did. And the police came. And Art said the words that changed my life. He said, I want to go to jail. And then he said, and Richard wants to go to jail too. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no. I want to get a job. I want to work for a big American company. And back then, if you'd gone to jail, you couldn't work for a big American company. Now you get a job with a big American company, then you go to jail. <laughs> I could have left. I could have left him right there. Good luck. But I didn't do it. Because I had three thoughts, two of them very intellectual, one not so much. The first intellectual one was, if they didn't want me to commit civil disobedience, why did they require me to read Thoreau? Why did they require me to study Gandhi? Pretty intellectual. Second one. I didn't go to Vietnam to protect the rights of people I don't know, to come home to find the rights of the people I really care about are gone. And the third one, okay, this was not so intellectual. How the hell are they going to fingerprint art? <laughs> this is something worth saying. So I said, I want to go to jail. And they took us to jail. <laughs> And in the morning, they took us to a judge, and they found us guilty. He said, guilty of what? Of breaking what was known at that time as an ugly law. <laughs> there were laws in 26 cities in the US prohibiting people with disabilities, the disgusting, grotesque,
disabilities from being on the public street because it would upset the people. They passed these law, laws when P.T. Barnum would bring his freak shows into town and they didn't want the freaks to come in later after the show and have a burger. I found out that in 1970, I was living in a disability apartment. Rehab at that time didn't even know how to get people jobs. If you went to rehab and said we want you to call employers, they would tell you it was beneath them. We came out of there. I'm depressed because I've got no job now. No one will hire me. I mean, you can't go to an employer and the employer's going to say, have you ever been arrested? Yes. For why? Re refusing to leave the International House of Pancakes. <laughs> you know how hard it is for a fat guy to say something like that? <laughs> what are they going to say? Was it buffet night? <laughs> Archer smiled and said, What's so funny, honeyman? He said, because they fed us while we were there. They gave us pancakes in the field. <laughs> he said, I got pancakes, so I still got my $10. <laughs> and I realized since I was never going to work in honest jobs, that I might as well hang in there with the group that I've been put into, people with disabilities. And I, I took a job to learn how to get people jobs with a private employment agency. I stayed there for just six months. I told them I'd only be there six months. I said, I'm going to take everything that you can teach me, and then I'm going to leave you. They said, that's fine. Most of our people only last four months. But I learned how people got jobs, and then I went back and translated it in my own head how people with disabilities should get jobs. I opened my house to disabled vets and disabled people in Portland, Oregon, and they came in. I had a ramp put in my house. I had phone lines provided to me by Catholic Charities, which is a wonderful, wonderful charitable organization in the U.S. And I started calling employers. And even though I didn't know what I was doing, we created the first job uh, clubs for people with disabilities in Portland, drop-in centers for people with disabilities. I was placing people with disabilities, developed the model for job developing as we know it today. Myself and a woman that some of you may know, uh, Denise Bissonette. Anyone ever heard of Denise Bissonette? She was my partner. Well, not partner, partner, in the sense we do. My business partner. Denise and I wrote the first book on job developing ever written in this country. And we created the model for job placement. I worked with employers. We kept up, Art and I did, and we eventually helped create the disability movement in the United States and helped in Canada. And we put together, helped put together and pass the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then I came up to Canada to work on your law on folks with disabilities. I have been working in job placement ever since. So when you hear this Vita, about all these accomplishments and things and movies and things. Just wind it down. And remember, ultimately, what I am, and what I always will be, is a job developer. Anyone remember the book that was popular years ago, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? That was a great book, wasn't it? You know, play nice, share, you pick your nose, don't eat it. <laughs> Everything that I know, I learned as a job of that. What we're going to do today is I want to talk to you about job placement, working with people with disabilities, employers and attitudes. And we're going to dive into this. We have a bit of time. And we're going to show you, I think, some neat stuff 
I'm going to show you what works, what doesn't work, how to access a hidden job market, what, how to work with, with employers, what their fears are, what their attitudes are, and we're going to have a good time with it. But I just wanted you to know not who I am, but I want you to know where I'm coming from. I am coming from where you are now. And though I get to talk to some pretty cool employers and a few important politicians and lots of folks who have entourages, I never am more proud than when I talk to people who give direct service day to day, sleep rolled up, tears held back, hope unrestrained with people with disabilities in our society. Because what you do, what you do, you know is work. But to them, it's magic. And they don't know how you do it. You are the genie in the lab. Let's spend the rest of the morning teaching them how to be a better genie, teaching them how to fulfill a few wishes that you may have been looking to figure out how to do, okay? Yesterday, we worked with employers and we dealt with attitudes that employers have towards people with disabilities. It is not as simple, I'm gonna sit through some of this because I, I stepped in the wrong hole in Vietnam too and, and I'm, ah, uh, uh, I'm not standing as well as I used to, but I figure if any group will forgive me, it'd be this one. <laughs> Bottom line. Actually, the VA sent me, you'll love this. The Veterans Administration in the U.S. sent me a letter and said, Richard, congratulations. We've reevaluated you and we've determined you are now a 100% disabled veteran. <laughs> and I called my partner, Milt. This is Milt Wright, my business partner. We've been together a long time. I don't even remember who was president when we first met. I, I don't even remember who I was married to when we first met. <laughs> I called Milton, I said, I'm a 100% disabled veteran. And Milton said, what are you gonna do about it? And I said, raise my speaking fee. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the attitude we need. It's not as simple as we like them, we don't. Attitudes impact on the way employers make decisions. And what we're going to do is I'm going to run you through an exercise, the same exercise that we did for the employers yesterday, and you'll be able to see what we do, how we do it, and I promise you, you will learn a lot about employers from this, this exercise. But I want you to participate. Don't give me answers that you think I want. Don't give me clever answers because you're in this field. I want you to just give me your gut reaction to all of these questions, okay? This is called Pick a Disability, and let's do it. I guarantee you, you will learn so much from this. Mill has some disabilities written on the board. Don't bother if you can't read them, we'll tell you everything's on here. First disability is blind. Second disability is CP, cerebral palsy, or cerebral palsy if you have a master's degree. <laughs> DD, developmental disability, but we mean it in the, in the, in the new sense what used to be considered mental retardation, but we can't use the, re the R word anymore because even though it's a medically accurate word, people have used the word so much as an insult that we can't tolerate it in our language anymore. So we've had to go find something else. This, this happens with, with all kinds of minority groups. And finally, paraplegia, paraplegia. You say, do I have to pick who I want to work with? No, we're going to use it a lot more important than that. People, which one of these disabilities do you want? You go to bed tonight, you wake up. You wake up with one of these disabilities and you keep it until you don't wake up anymore. You can be blind, you can have cerebral palsy, you can be DD or what we call in the US, uh, developmentally delayed, okay? That's, where, that's our compromise. Or you can be paraplegic. Which one of these would you have if you had to have one? And two, which one of these would you least want? So you get to pick two disabilities. One that you'd have if you had to have one, one that you least want. 
I'm going to give you a whole 10 seconds to think about it, and we'll start taking a show of hands. So think about it, and please, the more honest you are, the more you will learn about employers and the way they make decisions about your clients. They sent me to Winnipeg in February. I've never forgotten it. He's blamed me the last 30 years for doing that. My eyes froze shut. And I had to go back to the hotel to look and open them. Okay, let's do the yeses first. How many of you, you gotta vote once for yes, once for no, but only once for yes, only once for no. You, you can't like, I'm so, I'm so confused, I'll vote for everything. No, don't do that. How many, if you had that be something, how many said you'd be blind? To your hand, who wants to be blind? About 40. Who wanted cerebral palsy? Come on, who's gonna have cerebral palsy? One, two, any more? There's not a role play, you can get your hands up. Three, Three. okay. Three, so you have to see me. Developmental disability, or the old retardation, who'd like to be that? One, two, ten. What about 20? Paraplegic. Wow, look at the hands. 30. I think we got about 50 folks there. We have 130 here and there's 100 in the room, so Richard, you're not a good count. <laughs> Maybe people voted more than once. Okay, let's do the no's. How many said, no blind for me, no world of darkness for me, thank you very much. What about 25? Cerebral palsy. Who does not want to be moving in all directions at the same time? What do you think? About 40? 30? Okay. Developmental disabilities. Who does not want that? Wow. That's about 25 or so. And who does not want to be paraplegic? Cool. What do you think? About 18, 20? Okay, so what have we learned so far? Nothing. <laughs> well, not a trick, but. But I'm gonna ask the next question. Anyone wanna guess what the next question is? If you were a trainer, and you had 100 employers, and you could only ask one more question after doing this, what would you ask? One word. Why? Why? Why did you pick the one you picked to have? Why did you pick the one you picked not to have? I don't want a thesis. I don't want a paper. I don't want a paragraph. I'm not even sure I want a sentence. A word or two will work. How would it have affected you personally or professionally? Okay? So what I want you to do is think about that. We'll find out why you wanted the one you picked and why you didn't want the one that you didn't want. Again, I'll give you about 10 seconds to think about that. There are no right or wrong answers. Okay, we did the yeses first. Let's go ahead and do the noes, and they're all about equal, so let's just go across the board. Blind, how many of you said no to blind? Do not want to be blind. Who'll share with me what? Would, would you share with me? Why don't you want to be blind? You'll miss seeing everything the world has to offer. Well, what do you like to see? Everything. Sunrise, sunset. Beauty, beauty nature. Yeah. Wow, great. Who else doesn't want to be blind? Get me all kinds of reasons. Yes, over here. Lady in the hat. An artist, and I would be able to see what I'm painting. <laughs> Did you catch that, Bill? No. Repeat it. I'm an artist, and ah. I would want to... Can't do art. Miss out on that. <laughs> okay, yeah, it would make. What kind of art do you do? You do painting? Yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, there you go. Anyone else? Don't want to be blind. Get me all kinds of reasons. One more reason. Come on, folks. Who are the folks that want? Thank you. Wonderful. Because it would be so hard to do my job. Like, it would get to work 
Okay, it would just be hard. It would make your life and your job hard. Good, that's wonderful. Let's go down to cerebral palsy. Who did not want cerebral palsy? Let's see, you don't want it. Then just say no. Why, can I, can I pick on you right here? Yeah. Okay, you'd be moving a lot, you wouldn't have control. Of, of that movement, how would that make you feel? That to to just have uh, be moving and 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 it's not your body telling you you're not telling you what exactly what to do. Well, I feel embarrassed. Yeah, possibly embarrassed. I'm so frustrated. Frustrated. Okay, great. Out, but I wanted to get out to the I, I had a friend with cerebral palsy once say, having cerebral palsy is like having your teenager for your body. You tell it to do something, then it does whatever it wants. Okay. Anyone else? Don't want CP? Why don't you want CP? Lack of control. Lack of control. Loss of control. Any other reasons don't want CP? Back here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It would be such a struggle. It would be a struggle. How would it be, how would it be socially? How would it be, how would cerebral palsy look on? Yes, right back here. The mic's not working. You have to speak up. Uh, nobody can understand you, so anything you say doesn't get understood, you're, and you're never taken seriously. Yeah, you're not taken seriously. People can't understand you. What do they assume about you? That you're stupid. That you're stupid. That you're stupid. Now, we've used, I've used the word stupid in disability conferences before, <coughs> and the political correct people come out of the woodwork when you do that. You can't say stupid because that's demeaning towards people who have mental retardation. And it's not because they're different. And I will prove to you that they are different. How many know someone that has developmental disability or what we used to call mental retardation? Do they generally have an idea, a clue? Do they generally know that they have some retardation? Yes, they do. How many know someone who's stupid? <laughs> Do they know they're stupid? No, they have no clue. It's a totally different thing. A totally different thing. Okay. And, and while we're on the subject, who didn't want that? <coughs> what? I think um, the cognitive level is a part of your personality. I think out of all the disabilities, it would feel like I'm losing a part of myself. Wow, yeah. Because your sense of self, your intellect, your person. How, how many would feel that way? That you sort of wouldn't, you might be all right, but you wouldn't be you anymore. Or if you had another kind of disability, you would still be you. Okay, yeah. You would literally lose yourself. Why else wouldn't you want that? A lot of, the other, a lot of good reasons. Give me a couple. Yeah, back here. See these? We have two back here. <coughs> Maybe it would just be feeling like you had to depend on other people for everything. Right. Being dependent. How many don't like feeling dependent? There you go. And there was one more back in that area. Um, really valuing intellect, intelligence. Oh, so you value that. And so you would lose that thing that is, that is most valued to you, most precious. One of the things that's most precious to you. Okay? Yeah, great. Now, paraplegia, who does not want to be paraplegia? Don't want it. Got to get you right here. Why? I'm very active. Physically active? active. Sports, travel. Sports, travel, yeah. And you'd miss that. Couldn't do that. Well, could, but I would miss the physical part of it. You would miss the physical part of it. Okay. Great. Why else? Don't want to be paraplegia. Yes, sir. Basically, I'm just a really fast walker, speedy guy, so I feel like it would kind of slow me down. Okay, okay. Does it slow, slow you down? Yes, lady, right here. It would be very painful because of the fact that how the body is not, not going to be able to, is not mobile. 
So physically, you're going to have a lot of aches and pains, and you're going to have to live with that. Wow. It would hurt. It would hurt. It would hurt. Yeah. Yeah. The best answer we have is my friends wouldn't want me over because I would leave marks on the wall. <laughs> How many understand that comment? Yeah, I love that. If you don't understand it, talk to someone who raised their hand. Don't explain it to the people in chairs. They have a tip back and they tip on the wall. And they have little circles all over the wall. I, I personally consider them to be kind Drink, of like drinkers. signing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and do the yeses. Who wanted to be blind? Well, a bunch of people want to be blind. Okay, why would you? Why would you be blind? The accommodations would be easier. Lots of accommodations. How many work with folks that are blind? Are there not tons of accommodations, both electronic and other kinds of accommodations? Yeah. Why else want to be blind? Why would you want to be blind? You're real physical. You can still be physical if you're. I, I don't want to give you the answer, but is that close to it? They're still out in the community, still working, and I guess. <laughs> okay, so so you can be physical. You also know people that are blind, and they're out in the community, they're working. So you think, well, maybe you could be out in the community, you could work, you're familiar with it. How many pick blind because you're most familiar with that disability? Yeah, yeah, we have a tendency to do that. Is there any other reason that someone said yes to blind? In the back there. Well, I have memories of what I can see, but it's the least of the dependent disabilities of the three, of the three that you've given. You also have your mind still. So you have your mind, you have your hearing, and, and you would be more independent, right? You'd be more independent. And, the, you know, this lady raised her hand a couple times, we didn't get to her. Ma'am? No, right here. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, having watched... <laughs> having a friend who is blind, and I met her 40 years ago. Wow. And when her move, and she raised a family while being blind. Um, I thought, again, familiarity. She had, had gone to university as well. She had no limitations other than her blindness. And yeah, that's it. They had all, like someone else said, they had all the tools for her to be able to move. The only thing she couldn't do was drive. Okay, that's great. Let's go to the next one. Cerebral palsy. Who said yes for that? You would do it. Why would you do it? Well, he's <laughs> out. Don't, um, don't, don't scare him with that thing. Oh, uh, my sister actually has severe cerebral palsy, and I think I would like to know what it was like for her to see the world from her perspective. And also, I'm very familiar with all the possibilities and opportunities she's had. So. Okay. Familiar with it? Interesting perspective. You still have what? <clears throat> you see, you hear, you have your mind. Anyone else said yes to CP? Want to want to share? Anybody? Oh, right here. See that? Thank you. I didn't realize I had to talk. <laughs> Um, some of the people that I most admire and respect have cerebral palsy. Wow! Okay, that's great. Developmental disability? You would do it? What? Why? What? Yeah, right. Well, yeah, go to that one. We'll, we'll come back. Uh, the reason is because just because you're know, thinking intellectually is at the same level as a lot of other people are, maybe you're enjoying life okay okay yeah just how about everyone doesn't always have to be the smartest person in the room you know does like that and here right here yeah, basically I said for mine to live more simply like I've met some really happy persons with developmental disabilities who live in the now and they, they're just not they don't have all this confusion going on in the day. absolutely I, I had a friend who was into Eastern spirituality, and he told me one time uh, that he had met some folks that, that had mental retardation, and, and he said, they seem more zen. <laughs> Which, you know, living in the know, we work hard to get there. 
you know? They start out that way. So I said, wow, cool. Anyway, anyone else? No? Okay. Paraplegia. Lots of people wanted that. Who said yes to para? Okay. Well, can we? What? Because uh, you get to take Valium to control your muscle spasms. Oh, get to take drugs. What? <laughs> well, you know, I haven't heard that before. But I like it. I like it. Drugs. This is good. This is, this is, this is good. Yes. Yes. Well, this may not make sense, but I value my independence. So, um, I, I would, a big part of what I like about life are books, art, and music, not music, well, not music, but um, movies, right? So I don't want anyone explaining things to me or having to read things for me. And I know that there are some tools in place that I could have at least that to myself and for myself. So that's why. Okay, you have movies, you have books. I just, I just have a comment. I have trouble walking. And I took my daughter to a play. I live in Los Angeles. I took my daughter to a play last weekend at the Amundsen Theater downtown. We saw American Idiot. If you like rock and roll, you'll like the, movie, the play when it comes out. But I had, I sat on the side in one of those booths where we didn't have to go up and down stairs. And it was the best seat in the entire auditorium because I couldn't walk. So, yeah, you know, I, I got the cane, milk, limbs. We were walking down the lobby yesterday, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I said, we look like the March of the Penguins. <laughs> we should be finding an egg and protecting it somewhere here, which I think you could do in Winnipeg. <laughs> you could find the egg. I don't know if you could protect it. Anyone else? Paraplegic. Yes. Yes, sir, right here. By the way, you should give this man a hand. He's running back and forth. He's putting his microphone in here. He's showing his smile on his face. Uh, I think it would be the least amount of change to how I experience the world right now. So you sit a lot. I do. Yeah. No, 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 no. I no, I like the least amount of change. No, I like that. Anyone else? Anyone? How many have ever been in a power scooter? How many realize that you're a lot faster in that than when you walk? Yeah, yeah. Some days when I go places, I get those. Uh, uh, actually, they're fun. I just pass everybody, so it doesn't work out. Okay, stop. What have we learned? Nothing. But we're about to. What I want to do is I'm going to have Mill read the words on this board. Each of you had a word or two, and they all seemed logical, the yeses, the noes, all of that perfectly reasonable, just like all of the attitudes of society. If you look at each one of them, they seem reasonable, just as a, as a capsule. But let's read them all in a chunk and see how that works. Now, would you read the, the noes first? Sure can't see the sunrise or beauty, can't do art, can't do my job, it's too hard, loss of control, bad, bad movement, frustrated, struggle, no one understands me, I'm stupid, losing part of self, wouldn't be you, being dependent, lose independence, miss being physical, slow me down, painful. What kind of words are those? They're negative. They're what people can't do. They're words that, that suggest pain or anguish with the condition. Milt, would you read the, the yeses? I can do everything. Lots of accommodations. Effic efficient at work. Can be physical. Independence. Have my mind. Lots of opportunity. Have my mind. Most admiration. <coughs> Enjoy life. Live in the now. Uh, get to take drugs. <laughs> We remember who this guy is that said this. Independent, comfortable, must not must be able to read my writing. Okay, um, it's the it's the most amount of change that I like. Okay, what kind of words are those? They're positive, and they're descriptive of what someone can do, or the positive aspects of a disability. My friends. Which one's right and which one's wrong? 
not that easy, is it? What if I told you they were both right and they were both wrong? Why are they both right? You folks work with people with disabilities. Can you not find someone with cerebral palsy who is frustrated, who is angry at not having control of their body, who is looked down upon, who people discount? Can you find that person here in the city? Yeah. Can you find someone that is, 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 can think and see and hear and they get along and they work and they're doing okay? Can you find that person too? Absolutely. So they're both right. You know why they're both right? Because there are people with these disabilities, people who are in this category and they can be defined and they can be explained by the words on this board, both the positive and the negative. And they're both wrong. Why are they both wrong? Well, the first reason is that there's a range. There's a range to disability. And we didn't say what level any of you were going to be. Do you know in the absence of any additional information, there's always a tendency to assume most involved or worst case? I want you to picture a beautiful spring day and you're out in the street, you're about ready to cross the street, and the light changes, and you step off the curb, and you're going to, the, going to the other side of the street, and as you're walking, I want you to picture this. As you're walking, you look up, and you see there's somebody who's blind, and they are walking straight at you. How many can picture that? Picture that for me? Great. How'd you know they were blind? Who pictured someone with a cane? Who pictures someone with a dog? <coughs> Who pictures someone with big sunglasses like Ray Charles? Who pictured with someone with glasses like mine? Who pictures someone with no glasses at all? I didn't say totally blind. I said blind. The majority of people in our society that are considered blind have vision. Many of them just wear glasses. How many of you, if you did not have glasses or you did not have contact lenses, would be legally blind? Yeah, lots of people in this room. I love the term legally blind. Who is illegally blind? <laughs> Can we turn them in? Is there, is there an award? Can we get something? So when you go to an employer and you say, uh, I'm working with someone who's blind, what's the employer going to assume? Most involved. What do we assume when we say cerebral palsy? Are there people with cerebral palsy that would need a note from their doctor to prove to you they had anything at all? Are there people with cerebral palsy who are like my friend Art, or even more involved? What is the employer picture? Worst possible case. What is the employer picture with, with, with developmental disability? Do they picture someone? Are there not people with developmental disabilities, mental retardation, that you can have a conversation with? And at the end of the conversation, you might not be sure that they had that. Am I right? Especially if they said things you agreed with. <laughs> what are they going to picture? They're not going to picture that. They're going to picture the person who looks really developmental disabled, and the ones who just you know can't can't function. Or 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 they're going to picture. Down syndrome, which is most people picture when they think about that. They're going to picture someone who goes to shake their hand and shakes it for 23 minutes and won't let go. That's what they're going to picture. Paraplegia. Do you know that the paraplegia simply means an involvement of, 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 of the, uh, generally we think of the lower limbs? Are there people who are paraplegic who can walk? There are. Leg braces, crutches, canes. You say, given the venue that I'm in, you might see me in a wheelchair. I have a cane in this venue. Am I considered paraplegic? Yeah, to some degree, because all the nerves in my legs are dying from the Agent Orange I was exposed to in, in, uh, uh, in Vietnam. Three, four years from now, you'll probably see me in a scooter or a, or a, or a wheelchair. Then I'll really raise my feet. Bottom line, 
we have a tendency to think most involved. Two, even if it's not that, at any one point in the disability, you're going to have people for whom these things will be true and not true. There are people who are blind who consider their blindness to be no more than an inconvenience. That sounds like your friend. No more than an inconvenience. So they're both wrong. What kind of information do we have here about disability? We have none. We've done this whole exercise. We fill up this entire board, and we have no, even, and you're experts. We have no information about disability. Well, what do we have information about? We have information about the way people react to disabilities. And it doesn't matter whether you're an employer, or a person off the street, or a professional like yourself. Doesn't matter if you're if you're if you're Milt or you're me, and and they make movies out of your life. We all react to disabilities, and understanding why employers react and how that reaction affects their employment decision making process, their supervision process, their 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 uh, promotion process and management process is vital for anyone in this field. And it's vital for the employers to understand that too. So teaching employers to deal with their own attitudes and to work with them is one of the first and most important steps in job placement for people with disabilities. I believe that disability is an attitude. What? I mean, I, I I work with people who can't walk and they can't see or they can't speak or they, they've got no arms. You're going to tell me that's an attitude? No, but it's not a disability. You know what it is? It's an impairment. An impairment resides in the body, but disability resides in the attitude. How many know someone who is totally blind and they feel, oh, they act like it's pretty much no more than an inconvenience. They do everything. How many know someone who's blind and it's much more than an inconvenience, it has devastated their lives and they don't do much of anything? They have the same level of, of impairment. They're blind. But no one could argue that these two people have the same level of disability because one of them believes that they are disabled and the other believes that they are simply inconvenienced. We take people who are impaired, and it is our job not to fix them. It is our job to make sure that they never believe that impairment is a disability. The work you do is as important as any doctors, any therapists. We keep impaired people from being disabled. Why do we react? Why do employers react? And how does it affect their decisions? Well, let's go through three reasons why employers react to disability. And by the way, we react to reason number one, what you don't know. Would anyone here in this room be so bold as to raise your hand and say, I am an expert in all disabilities? Of course you would. And I have to put my hand down as well. Yet. Where did we get the information that we have about disabilities? Where did we get the assumptions we have? Why do we believe what we believe about disabilities? Even though you may work in the field, I gotta tell you, for a lot of us, our ideas about disabilities were formed when we were very young. Uh, I had an employer one time, he was a great employer. He was the first employer to want to put a woman in a non-traditional woman's job in a factory. He was the first one who wanted to hire African Americans in jobs that were not considered proper for them. He was the most liberal, open-minded supervisor I ever had. He's the first one who hired someone in a wheelchair. So imagine how shocked I was when I got a call from the company and said, we're having a trouble with the supervisor. 
We send him someone with epilepsy and he refuses to let them on the floor. And I went to him and I said, what's the matter? You're like my best supervisor that I work with of all the employers I have. He said, epilepsy. My uncle had epilepsy, and every Christmas they would come over, and my uncle would like pass out in the mashed potatoes, and we'd have to we'd have to lift his head up and take the mashed potatoes out of his nose so he didn't die. I can't have that here in the workplace. What do I do? I said, Well, I know I keep mashed potatoes off the floor if I were you. <laughs> he said, No, I what do I do? What didn't he know? Well, what he knew was that his uncle was probably taking so, so many depressants, uh, uh, probably phenobarbital at that time, which, by the way, is a good drug, but you can't get it anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, and it would make him pass out. Do people with epilepsy take huge depressants anymore to control seizures? Actually, not so many of them. They're actually finding mood elevators. Back in the days, what happened is they 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 give you enough to control the seizure. And when they found out that they control the seizure, then they double it to make sure. So people with epilepsy 30 years ago walked around in a stupor. What do they do today? They give you enough to control the seizure, then they cut the dosage in half and see if that still controls the seizure. Then they cut the dosage in half and see if that still controls the seizure. So everyone is taking the minimum amount of medicine, and now the new seizure control medicines, many of them aren't depressants at all, but they're actually mood elevators, and they don't, they don't impact on that. He believed what he didn't know. Cerebral palsy, oh my gosh, 30 years ago, call United Cerebral Palsy, great organization, both in the U.S. and Canada. United Cerebral Palsy. Ask him what percentage of people with cerebral palsy have retardation 30 years ago. What would they tell you 30 years ago? 90%. Call them today. And since we don't use the word retardation, how many of them are developmentally delayed? What will they tell you? Less than 5%. How'd that happen? 30 years ago it was 90%. Today it's 5%. What major medical advances have we made in intelligence and cerebral palsy, my friend? We've made none. None. Okay, we did two things. We stopped assuming they were retarded and we learned to measure their IQ. What you don't know. Every one of us, I believe, in this field tends to find a comfort zone of disability. We work really well with one kind of disability. Maybe it's blind, maybe it's physical, maybe it's intellectual, maybe it's learning disability, maybe it's mental illness. But that doesn't mean that we got it together on everything else. Some of us, you know, will look over at other people's case and go, wow, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm real good with the, the quadriplegic, but I don't know how you work with those schizophrenics. I'm, I'm real fine with the people with epilepsy, but I have no idea how you work with, with this guy over here. And so we're all a little like that. Never make a hiring decision or an employment decision based on some assumption or belief about people with disabilities. How many of you, by show of hands, have had employers not want to hire your people? Some person you've had not because of what they knew about the person, but because of what they thought about the person's disability, which may not have even been true for that person. Everybody in this room, everybody. So we're telling you, if you want to know what we tell employers, we tell them first not to do that. What you don't know. How about this, what you do know. What does that mean? We tend to think that, that, that people have, have uh, well, experience with someone with a disability, and that experience is going to give them great wisdom to what everyone with that disability is like. Is that true with race? Is that true with gender? Is it true with sexual orientation? Is it true with ethnicity? No, it's not true with any of those. Why should it be true for disability? Well, let's just say that 
I'll pick on someone here. Oh, you just sat down. We pick on you. <laughs> You're a supervisor. And you've got openings. You maybe you've got a file clerk opening, okay? And I want you to hire a little person. Person of short stature. What we used to call a dwarf, but we don't call him that anymore because it's become a bad word. But I think you're prejudiced. Have any of you ever tried to, to soften an employer up who might have had a, <clears throat> a negative view of a disability? Kind of soften him up, kind of educate him? Sure. So I'm going to send you a note, say, think small. Take you to Willow. Give you a copy of Wizard of Oz. So finally she's going to come to me and say, okay, give me a dwarf. I don't know how a dwarf can be a file clerk. Well, they specialize in L through Z. <laughs> I love you group. You know what? I told the same group to the employers yesterday and they didn't get it. <laughs> so sad. So sad. Anyway, so I give you the little person, <clears throat> best employee you've ever had. Comes in early, leaves late, gives blood, brings baked goods on Monday. Are you happy? You're thrilled. So I call you. How are things going? He says, all these dwarfs are the best little employees. Give me six. <laughs> Tell me that doesn't happen. You place someone with a disability in the company, and, and, and they work out really well, and you get a call from the employer two months later. Oh, uh, you got any more of those? What? Well, you sent me someone who had one leg the other day. They worked out pretty good. You got any more people with one leg? <laughs> what? <laughs> and what you want to say is that the reason they're doing a good job isn't because they have one leg. The reason they're doing a good job is because they're a really good employee. So part of you wants to say, excuse me, but a disability is not a qualification. You can't call up an order three people in wheelchairs because one worked out. What you really need to do is tell me what are the characteristics of this employee and I'll try and match those characteristics with other people in my caseload and maybe they will have the same disability as the one you have or maybe they won't. Maybe they'll have something completely different. How many know that that's the, the first thing that you should be telling them? Right? But what do we do? because we really need to make these placements. And you're thinking, do I have three? Can I get them three? Can I get them there today? And so what happens is employers tend to, to, to assume that if one person with a disability is good in a job, they don't assume that that person is good. They assume they've made a what? A good match. Now they, now they know where these people in wheelchairs can work. Now they know where these people that are blind can work. Now they know where the deaf can work. And suddenly, what have we created? Clusters. Where companies have all the people who are deaf working in the computer room and all the people that are blind working in the, in the in, you know, putting little screws and little, little bags and, 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 and all the people that are deaf working in the noisy place. And the bottom line, if you did that with, with gender or race, you'd go to jail. Yes, we hire women, we put them in building A. And we hire uh, Native Canadians, we put them in building B. Unless they're women, then we let them visit building A. We hire Lutherans, we put them in the mail room because they're so good at posting notices. You'd go to jail. But when we do it for people with disabilities, what do they do? We give them the Employer of the Year Award. Be careful. What you don't know can cause you not to hire. What you do know can cause you not to consider. I went to Romania a couple of years ago. The US Department of State asked me to go to Romania and work with them on the way they treat people with disabilities because they were having trouble with the European Union. And I met with the non-governmental uh, organizations and I worked with them. The history of Romania and disability is a sordid, sad 
history. And I met with the top, uh, the head of the main university for Romania in charge of rehab. This guy, you cannot become a special ed teacher, you can't become a rehab counselor, you can't become a job developer for people with disabilities without going to his university and without graduating under his department. And they brought me to talk to him, and he told me all about what they teach people. And I said, so, uh, you train the people that find jobs for people with disabilities in Romania? He says, yes, I do. I said, so where do people with disabilities work in Romania? He said, if you're deaf, you make shoes. If you're blind, you sculpture. If you are retarded, you stack boxes in warehouses. I said, what if I'm deaf and I don't want to make shoes? He said, then you live on the streets in Bucharest and you sleep in the sewers with the other people with disabilities that will not get with the program. My God. That was three years ago in Romania. You think, how backwards are they? Yeah, because it was only 20 years ago here. We were trying to make progress. And the first thing, if you come away with nothing else from this morning, I want you to come away with this. I was in New York, and I had a, 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 a HR person for a big, big international company. He said, I've been listening to you, Dr. Pimentel, and it's occurred to me that I have a job in my own company that should be done better by someone in a wheelchair. What would you do if someone called you and said, I have a job in my company that could be done better by someone in a wheelchair? I would think, wow, who do I have in a wheelchair, right? Send them right over. I said, you got a job that should be done better by someone in a wheelchair? Yeah, what should I do? I said, you, you go to bed early. You wake up early. You go to a rental supply store. You rent a wheelchair. You bring the wheelchair into work. You find the person doing that job. You put them in the wheelchair. You watch production go up. He said, what? I said, if you've got a job, it should be done better by someone in a wheelchair. Put someone in a wheelchair and let them do it. He said, are you crazy? I said, that's irrelevant. <laughs> No good jobs for people in wheelchairs. But there are people in wheelchairs who do a good job. There are no good jobs for people who are deaf. But there are people who are deaf who are doing a good job. And there are no good jobs in college for people with disabilities. But there are people with disabilities who should be considered for every job in the city. We come from a field that years ago believed that you could put people in jobs by matching their disability to the job. We have found that's not true and we have to fight. We have to fight the employers who believe it's true. We have to fight the rehab counselors who believe it's true. We have to fight, in some cases, our own co-workers who still believe it's true. And we have to say that it's not the disability that's important. It's not what you have that's important. It's who you are. You know, the most important skill that anyone with a disability can possibly have to be successful in employment it is the ability to sit down with an employer and get that employer to see past what they have, to be able to see who they are. It's not that much different than what you do every day when you have a new client. 
They first come to you and the emphasis is what? What do they have? But eventually, as you work with that person, you begin to learn who they are. What they have will never tell you where they should work. But once you decide who they are, and you see who they are as a unique human being, then you know you can place them. I'm going to say something that may seem outrageous to you, but I'm going to say it. How many of you do job placement? You try and get people jobs. You can't place anyone you don't love. I don't mean in a romantic way. But there must be something about everyone that you find a job for that you love. And part of a, a, a job developer's goal should be to find that one thing in each client that you can love. And once you find that one thing, then you will have the hook to hook like a Christmas ornament on the tree. That's what you sell. And sometimes, oh my gosh, we have some unlovable clients. You know we do. But when we find that one thing that we love, we can sell that to an employer. And if you have a client and can find nothing about them that you love, give them to a job developer who can. And you work with the ones that you do. Third reason, employers react, pain. Look how much pain is on this board. Look at all the negatives. Fear, frustration, unhappiness. We'll miss being physical. We'll can't do art. We'll miss all of these things. If you think if I have this disability, I would just feel terrible. We said that. We said that. The employers yesterday said that. Now I want to show you what that means in your job. I want you to think about the disability that you wanted, the one you wanted to have. Now look down at the board to the ones who didn't want it. And what they wrote about the ones you wanted and why they didn't want it. Now let me ask you a question. If you have the disability, that you pick. Would you want to interview with someone who thought it was the worst disability on the board for a job? You wouldn't, would you? You'd want to interview with someone who thought it was the best disability. Yeah. And you know what that means? It means every one of you, because you wanted one, might be a really cool person for that person with disability to interview with. And every one of you, as, as astute and as good a human being as you are would be someone that someone with a disability would choose not to interview with. If you think you would be frustrated with CP, when you see someone with CP, you will see frustration in their face. Even if they're not frustrated. Because it's our frustration we project that frustration upon them. And when it comes back to us, we believe that we've seen it from them. The pity and the pain we see in the faces of people with disabilities 